Amen. Hey, once again, we're in our study, World Religions, Cults, and the Occult. Pastor Tom, it's number 13 entitled? That's right. Okay, I had a dramatic pause there to get it all in. He did it. Woo, that's right, Pastor Tom. He's got it in there. Yeah, I didn't even have to ask for the tagline. That's amazing. But hey, by way of recap, we're dealing with the, the issue. It is part two. Part one was what? Dealing with the false teachings and all kinds of other aberrant behavior of the charismatic movement. Now we're getting into this aspect, the untold history of the charismatic movement. Why? Because we are dispelling this myth out there. It's not just a myth. It's a lie. That uh, the reason why what we're seeing, uh, the wiggling, the shaking, the, uh, the occult-like behavior, and frankly, sometimes occult behavior, whether people realize or not, the Hinduism, the New Age coming into the charismatic movement, uh, is because uh, they say it's the latest uh, movement of God in the last days. This is why it's so strange. It's a special outpouring of God's Spirit only uh, for our time. No, it's not. This is the same old thing been repackaged throughout history. Now, we saw that so far in our history study uh, with Montanism right after the death of the last apostle John. Then he had to deal with that. Throughout the Dark Ages, certainly it continued through Catholicism and a lot of their mystical practices. Lord willing, we'll eventually get to that as well. And there's the merging with uh, uh, charismatic movement and Catholicism. The Shakers and the Irvingites hopped over the pond over here to America. Kind of, if you will, the first charismatics over here. Mormonism, Joseph Smith's man speaking in tongues. He was a prophet. He had a word from God. God, remember that? The charismatic mindset gives birth to that as well. Then the whole holiness movement, we saw the holiness movement had nothing to do with holiness, right? Number one, they were infected by a false teaching by John Wesley, who taught the false teaching that you could become perfect in your walk with Jesus Christ before you get to heaven, right? Once again, how many guys are married? That right there, when you get married, that will dispel that lie. Okay, there's your acid test. So get married if you're single, and you'll find out you're not perfect. Okay, that's the encouraging word tonight, Doug, for you, single man. All right, okay, so, <laughs> but anyway, so uh, not only were they infected with that, but then they said, uh, also, in order to achieve that state of so-called spiritual perfection, you need a second dose of the Holy Spirit, right? Which we saw, no, when you get saved, what? You get the Holy Spirit of salvation. You don't need more of the Holy Spirit. If anything, you need to get out of the way, and he gets more of you as you walk and live and keep in step with the Spirit. And then they say, then the evidence of you getting this supposed second dose is speaking in gibberish. Now, why do I say gibberish? Because it ain't a known language. Acts chapter 2 says it's supposed to be a known language if it's even in function for today. So that's the whole holiness movement. What's that got to do with holiness? That won't produce holiness, and you certainly won't become a disciple because you're led astray with these false teachings. Then it went to another guy. Uh, uh, Charles Finney we saw then it spread after that into various conferences and began to pop up and frankly remember we saw what was the fruit of this thing everywhere it went what did it go it caused division man remember churches were splitting down the the middle man the second dose of the spirit of God speaking in gibberish and all that stuff okay and then the church of God now we left off with this guy right here salvation army okay the salvation army actually came out of this okay and so we're going to take a look at that tonight. Who are they? And uh, what kind of charismatic things uh, are they involved in? Well, before we get there, the reason why we're doing this is because we're fuddy-duddies. We're resisting the Spirit of God in the last days. That's why we're doing it. We think we know everything. Who do you think you are? He, all the, no, that's not what we're doing. We're actually being obedient to the Bible. You know why? Because God says, don't listen to anybody who comes to you and say, God told me to tell you. You're supposed to test the Spirit. Right? Open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. If you find 2 John, what do you do? Hang on left. If you find 3 John, what do you do? If you find 4 John, what do you do? Throw it away. Send them out. If you find John over here sitting in the pew next to me, what do you do? Take him out to supper. Do something. We're Christians, right? We're supposed to love one another. That's right. But uh, 1 John chapter 4. Uh, verses 1 through 3, right? Are we being arrogant? Are we just being fuddy-duddies? Or as we're being charged, you're just resisting the sp God's spirit in the last days. Who do you think you are? You got a spirit of religiosity and, you know, all those terms that are thrown at it. No, we're doing what the Bible said to do. Not just be a brain. You're supposed to put things to the test, right? And here's what he says. Dear friends, do not believe what? Every spirit, right? But what? Yeah. Test them to see whether they are from God. We can stop right there. Now, why would he say that? Because he also warned us, the Bible warned us, what's going to happen, especially in the last days. But we saw, and it's been going out through all church history, liars, deceivers, false teachers, false prophets. So you can't take anything for granted. You've got to be that Berean and go back to the word. 
You put it to the test. I don't care if somebody's behind a pulpit. I don't care if they're wearing a robe. I don't care if they squint one eye. God told me to tell you. Oh, you know, they're so, uh, I, hey, I don't, I'm not taking nothing from you. I'm, it's got to be here. And this is an order from God for our protection, by the way. He says, uh, why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God, right? Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God, right? So basically, does it line up with biblical doctrine? Now, how are you going to learn biblical doctrine? Rhymes with the Bible. That's right, Chris. It's in the Bible. You read the Bible to learn biblical doctrine, i.e. what the Bible teaches. That's what that means, right? And so you know whether, hey, wait a second. No, that's not the real Jesus, and that's not the real gospel. You test it according to God's word, right? And this, he says, when the false one, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So let's continue with this premise that, again, the reason why we're seeing this aberrant, weird behavior that, granted, we may not find in the Bible, which we don't find in the Bible, and the Bible certainly doesn't condone it, i.e., this charismatic behavior, right? Again, the justification is, well, the, the, the reason why is because it's this latest movement in the last days of the Spirit of God. That's why it's so strange. Really? Let's put that to the test, right? Now, we've already been doing that throughout the history, but let's put it to the test up to the Salvation Army, right? I mean, surely they're Christian. They're preaching the gospel, right? Yeah, you're nervous after what I started off with, with putting money in that kettle, aren't you? But anyway, let's just move on. Uh, No, the Salvation Army, okay, you recognize the old uh, shield there, right? Was founded in 1865. Now, for those of you hooked on math, that is over 40 years prior to the Azusa Street Revival, 1906, I believe, is when they said that this latest movement began. No, this kind of stuff's been going on for a long time. It's just been repackaged. So this was 1865. Now they describe themselves as a part of the Christian church. And frankly, I think most people think they are. But I think you're going to see tonight, no, they're not. And we'll see that proof. Now, they they got distinctive governances and practices. Most people recognize them with their, again, the red and white shield, as you can see there, the Salvation Army. They're also involved, of course. Uh, Even the secular world works with them, the social services. They they respond to disasters. They feed the homeless. They run these thrift stores, and we're familiar with that, and that's great. But are you really Christian? And what do you got to do with the false teachings of the charismatic movement? Well, we'll take a look. Again, it was founded in 1865 by this guy, a guy named William Booth. Okay, he saw a great need for reaching the poor and the destitute in England with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that's great. Uh, But the key word is, is it really the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yeah, we'll find out here in a little bit, right? Now, uh, these people responded to, quote, the gospel, or dare I say, the gospel he was sharing. So these poor destitute people in London started, uh, and homeless people, they started responding to what he was sharing. Now, he directed them, listen to this, he directed them to various churches and chapels in their neighborhoods, but these undesirables came into the proper Victorian churches with their coffers, and, and these homeless people were messing up their show, right? So, it, that, and I don't condone that. So, they rejected these guys, okay, because they're clothing and dress and habits and and probably didn't smell too well. But, and so Booth comes in, and again, I don't doubt this, is, that's good. He, he rose up and did the right thing. So he, he provided a place for these guys that were getting saved, the homeless that he was taking care of, and uh, discipled them. But again, what are you discipling them in? We'll get to that in a second. He founded the East London Christian Mission, and uh, he was dictating a letter one day referencing believers as God's army. Well, guess what? The name stuck. And that's why it was called Salvation Army. But again, what salvation are you promoting? I'm giving you teasers, folks. And we'll see that in just a second. So that's where he got that. And so he began to run with that theme, the army theme. And basically, if you know them, they they wear the military uniforms. They got a military structure. Well, he went serious on that that whole army theme, okay? Now, uh, he named himself the General of the Salvation Army, Okay, now his wife, uh, Catherine, as you can see here, he named her the mother of the Salvation Army. And here's where you get, once again, unfortunately, 
the charismatic influence, let alone the false teachings. From the beginning, women were given the same authority as men, and Catherine was an ordained minister in the organization. We already went through that. Is that what the Bible says? No. So right out of the gates, what's this guy doing? Uh, granted, he's taking care of the homeless, and granted, the churches are being absolutely hypocrites for not allowing these people to come in and worship. Who cares if they don't smell proper or they got clothes? Hell, praise God. You know, they're getting saved. Maybe. We'll see that in a second. Okay, so I'm not condoning what they did. And he's out, you know, providing a place for them. That's great. But all of a sudden, you're going off script. And what's the script? The script's right here. And, so, and it starts going downhill from here, folks. Okay, so, so his wife, right? Uh, he decided that she was going to be uh, ordained as well. Okay, in fact, today in the Salvation Army, the ordination of women is permitted. All right, now if you look at a lot of charismatic churches, what is it? It's not just a pastor man, but what? By proxy, it's the wife. It's Pastor Susie too, the husband, you know, that's the same thing. Well, this is nothing new, folks. This was going on 1865 with Salvation Army, okay? Anyway, so they obviously, the army officers obviously originally were only allowed to marry other Salvation Army, quote, officers. So that's kind of getting kind of cultish there. Uh, but recently, in recent years, that's been uh, uh, relaxed a little bit. Husbands and wives would share the same rank and have the same similar assignments, and officer couples were then assigned together as, quote, co-pastors. But again, that's not biblical. Now, another big thing that the Salvation Army originally, if you don't realize this or not, we know them now today for thrift stores and disaster relief and all that stuff. But there was a big thing that they do, which again is being done today. We've talked about this multiple times, but they were also big into music, right? Now, why did they use the music? The music was to draw the people in to get them to get acquainted with the Salvation Army. And then that's where they unfortunately get hooked into their false teachings. Do we see anybody doing that today? Yeah, it's the same issue dealing with Bethel and Hillsong. They're using music to suck people in. They've never heard of Bethel Church, but they hear that song. They go check out that song. They get acquainted with it, and then they get acquainted with the church, and then the charismatic baloney that comes along with it, unfortunately. Same, nothing new under the sun. Salvation Army was doing this. Okay, now listen to this. As the popularity of the organization grew, the Salvationists worked their way through the streets of London, attempting to convert uh, individuals. They were sometimes confronted by unruly crowds. So here it comes. A family of musicians began working with the Salvation Army and played music, quote, to distract the crowds. Right? People are saying, we don't like what you're doing. And as you're going to see why, I, I don't, maybe it was because we don't like what you're teaching. You got female pastors, and we're going to see you got a false gospel. So guess what? So here comes the band to distract people. Look over here. Don't, don't pay attention to the false teaching we got. Does that sound familiar today? Folks, 1865. Nothing new in the sun. All right? Now, uh, they, 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 they did brass bands. That was big back in the day. Choirs. They had huge concert bands. Okay, so music became a big thing to draw people in and, frankly, distract them. Now, uh, you may not know this, but the, Ar the Salvation Army had a successful hip-hop group called Joy Strings. In the 60s and 70s, during the era of the Beatles, the Salvation Army had their version. I kid you not, in the UK. And they were on the top of the charts. They got national television coverage, and they were very, very popular. So let's journey back in time to a music group of the Salvation Army. Get ready. The Joy Strings. Let's take a look. <laughs> At Brixton Market, they're used to the Salvation Army, but not this way. No tambourines, no trombone. The joy strings in their hit parade number, it's an open secret. He had a new general, and he had a press conference. And they said, um, what are you going to do about your work with young people? And he uttered the fatal words, if we need to, we will take up electric guitars and go into coffee bars. And that was it. BBC came on to us at the training college where I was then on the staff and I was called into the uh, principal's office and he said, um, Captain Webb, you, tonight you will take a group of girl cadets and guitars and appear on the Tonight programme. Joy then asked all the other officers 
And uh, the officer who was in charge of the men at that time was Captain John Larson. He said, I have two cadets who have got guitars. I've seen them, but we couldn't play them. But that's how we were chosen. And that's literally how it started. The um, viewers just absolutely jammed the switchboard and said, we like this, they're clean, we can understand what they're singing. They smile, we like it. Just so happened that one of the bigwigs at the EMI recording company at that time was watching. And he rang Robert Dockrell, who was in charge of all Salvage Army recordings uh, at EMI, and said, what are we doing with this little lot? Have we got them in the studio yet? <laughs> That's a good story, really, because, of course, we didn't have any music. It's all right going on to television with a T-chess bass and a few guitars and stringing a few choruses together, but it's very un-all right to go into a technical studio with a T-chess bass. You need to get a string bass, you need to get some music, and you need to get a drummer. We started writing. I mean, it was just sheer necessity. The first song I wrote was this Open Secret song. So we went and recorded it, Abbey Road. Beatles come out and we go in. We didn't know it was going to be released. About six weeks later, someone said to us, Do you know you're in it, Parade? And we didn't. We hadn't a clue what it would mean, of course. I mean, we were just besieged after that. Love that's in my heart, so The reaction of the public was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Six, seven thousand people over the road here at St Paul's Cathedral, closing off the road and the police coming down because we played on the steps of St Paul's. It was fulfilling the mission exactly of the vision of General Coots, of, of Fred Coots, when he said, we must go to the people and speak in their language. And what did they use as the tool? Music, and folks, what's going on today in so-called Christian music? A lot of it's just a secular feel. You, we talk about this all the time. It's, is it who are you singing about? It's not even God. You just, and it's just to draw the crowds in. But their movement actually began with unruly crowds. People were not liking what they were doing, and you're going to see with their teaching. And uh, so music became the distraction, and then it became the seduction to get involved. Right? Again, nothing new under the sun. It's being repeated today. Salvation Army, uh, the, again, the ministers, you can see with the, the, the gear and the hit, how, was, were those hats just hip or what? I mean, that was, I, I forgot to tell you, after that recording studios, they went to Beach bl Blanket Bingo and they filmed this, no, I'm just kidding, whatever, but that was the beatsters. But anyway, uh, they're given the military officer ranks and their duties and the, the, the garb, the whole nine yards. So again, he took this army theme all the way down the line. Now, also, here is with some other problems with their teaching, not only as female pastors uh, and using music to distract people from, don't look over here, what we're doing and teaching. Uh, Booth eliminated all forms of outward observance in his church. So, and this is still in function today. You go to a Salvation Army service, there is no baptism and no communion is practiced. Why? Why would you cut that? That's kind of weird, Right? But again, this guy's literally making it up. He's the general, right? Now, they follow basically, again, if you're familiar with the term, Arminian theology. And that's much of what drives the charismatic community. And just one big uh, aspect of that is typically that they believe you can lose your salvation. That is based on man's efforts. And we're going to see that in a second. But man, the reason why is because, listen, the Salvation Army teaches, and I quote, the continued, your continued salvation depends on continued obedience to the word of God. Stop right there. What is that? That is a false gospel. Is your, be, your salvation dependent upon how obedient you continue to be to God's word? If any of you said yes, 
I'm sorry to tell you, if you're truly trusting that, you're not saved. Because salvation, the gospel, is on the work of Jesus Christ. And the reason why we do what we do is because we love him and we're thankful for our salvation being complete. And that we know that we're going to stumble and bumble at times. We're not condoning that. But again, the process of maturity is you walk and live and keep and step the spirit. You don't become sinless in order to keep your salvation. That's a works-based false gospel. This is what they're teaching, right? But you hopefully sin less. But guess what? It's safe and secure in Jesus Christ. These people, folks, are not teaching that. They're not teaching the gospel, okay? Uh, today, the army carries on a wide range of work, including prison visits, disaster responses, refugee assistance, addiction and dependency treatment, daycare, children's homes, homeless, domestic violence, shelters, thrift stores, hospitals, clinics, schools, and this is being done worldwide. The Salvation Army is one of the largest providers of social help. It's got permanent ministries, listen, in 127 countries, 175 languages that assist millions of people per year but you're preaching a false gospel this is no different it might be a surprise but it's a no different than jehovah's witnesses and mormons doing good deeds i'm not against the good deeds but good deeds don't get you in heaven and we say all the time uh much of even the evangelical church it's just called the social gospel now you're out there doing good deeds that's great but you're not even sharing the gospel well, these people are doing great deeds and helping people with needs. That's great. But then you're sharing a false gospel. And that's a problem. Now, let me read. I'm just going to reiterate this again, folks. Uh, this is from their salvation. This is their, quote, 11 doctrines from the Salvation Army. And I quote, we believe, this is article number nine. We believe that continuance in a state of salvation depends upon continued obedience of faith in Christ. Obedience faith. Obedience is your works. So, you better think twice before you drop something in that bucket. I'll just be blunt with you. So, I didn't know this before I went to this study, so I will never give to these people ever again. Because what are you supporting? A false gospel. You can't do it. You just can't do it. Now, in 2004, uh, you're thinking, how do they do this? Well, again, they're looked upon society. Well, these guys are the do-gooders, right? They're like Red Cross. They're like, you've got to support these people. Right? But again, the, the sad thing is, uh, I'd, wanna, I'd almost want, rather want to support a secular one than these guys, because these guys are leading people straight to hell, if it's a works-based gospel. Right? But listen to this. In 2004, the Salvation Army received a, listen, 1.6, not million, 1.6 billion donation from Joan B. Kroc, uh, the third wife of the former McDonald's CEO, Ray Kroc. Okay? And so to me, I'm thinking that's the ultimate Croc that they get supported with billions of dollars to what? Ultimately, yes, they draw people in with their music. Yes, they're doing great things with disaster relief and, 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 and helping the homeless and the rehabs and all that stuff. But in the end, you basically say, go to hell. And isn't that like the enemy to make sure that somebody who's preaching a false gospel gets lots of support financially to make sure they can keep doing that false gospel thing. Isn't that wild, okay? Now, that's just the Salvation Army, okay? Now we're gonna move to the next big guy. This is considered one of the biggest pillars of the charismatic movement today. A lot of them don't know their history, unfortunately. That's why we're going through this, partly, the reason why. Uh, but this guy is the guy. He's like the pioneer. And again, we saw this has been going on for a long time anyway. But they'll go back at least far back as this guy, the, the pre-Azusa days. And that's this guy. You may have heard of him. Smith Wigglesworth, right? Now, a key phrase that he's got, you're dealing with some serious charismatic influences, is he's got, you will have to have what? Fire. Now, remember, that's a code word, right? That's fire. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit, right? And as Ron and I were having a serious discussion last week, very spiritual, you know that if you want to sound spiritual, you've got to put uh after all kinds of uh, words, right? I mean, that's when you're preaching, right? You got to have fire, uh, from the Holy Spirit of God, uh. I open up the Bible, uh, I'm getting evangelistic, uh, on you, uh, right? But anyways, that's a code word, right? The secret of the power, you got to get the fire, right? You know, that's, 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 a, that's a buzzword that they use, okay? And of course, what they mean is what? This supposed second dose of the Holy Spirit, which is not even biblical, that's supposed to make you perfect in your walk with Jesus Christ and give you all these power, Anyway, that's Smith Swigglesworth. That's him right there. Uh, he, was, uh, came, he came from Yorkshire, England. 
He was born in 1859. As a small child, he worked in the fields pulling up turnips. Mm -mm. How many of you guys ever eat turnips? Man, I did back in Kansas. You don't see them out here. I used to eat them raw. That's the only way. Hey, don't cook them. They smell like, man, you just are, you burned your tire or something. I don't know. Right? Or your, your neighbor's cat, which I don't recommend either. But, man, don't do it. Don't do it. Right? Or, I tell you what, that could be a technique. If you ever have those guests, it's like 1.30 in the morning. You got to get to church services. It's Saturday night. No offense to anybody who's come to my house. But they just don't leave. Hey, go to the sto- stove and boil some turnips, man. They'll leave in five minutes. That stuff just stinks. But anyway, so turn. No, we used to eat them raw. Do you guys ever eat them raw? Raw with salt. <laughs> that's the only way to eat them, man. That's, let's move on. So he picked turnips. The smith. <laughs> I got the fire. No, uh, pulling turnips alongside his mother. <clears throat> he also worked in factories to help provide for his family. Now, he was illiterate because he was always working. So I feel sad for him, but the, remember, the guy's illiterate. All right? Now, he, uh, he was, guess what influenced him? His family was influenced and were considered Methodists. Now, what's the problem with the Methodist movement that we've been seeing the last few weeks? These guys got influenced by John Wesley with the false teaching that somehow you can, it's called perfectionism, which is the false teaching, that you can be perfect in your walk with Jesus Christ if you just get this second dose of the Spirit. So his family was influenced with that. Again, every one of these people are influenced with this charismatic mindset false teaching, right? Uh, In fact, uh, uh, his grandmother was a devout Methodist as well. Well, eventually he grew up from picking turnips and stuff, and he married this lady, a Polly Featherstone, in 1882. And at the time, here comes your second charismatic influence. At the time uh, of their marriage, guess what she was? Quote, a preacher with the Salvation Army. Well, there's your another. See, it's all tying together, isn't it? Right? And so she was supposed to be a pastor. That's who we married. And uh, they had uh, one daughter, Alice. They had four sons. Uh, Seth, Harold, Ernest, and George. Polly died in 1913. And uh, Smith Wigglesworth's grandson, Leslie, served as the president for the Elim Pentecostal Church. So just basically heavy-duty uh, charismatic. Now, he did eventually learn to read after his wife taught him by reading the Bible. So that's good. But he continued after he married her, supposedly as a female preacher. Not good. Okay, Uh, but he worked as a a plumber and then he just abandoned him. So I'm going to be a preacher. So no training that I'm aware of and just hit the road. All right. And so in 1907, so he's already infested with false teachings from the Methodists and his second supposed blessing and perfectionism, whatever. He's already infected with the idea that you can have female pastors from the Salvation Army and who knows what else other false teachings. Was he even trusted in a works-based gospel like the Salvation Army? I don't know. So, so he's already that. Then he visits this guy, okay, this guy named Alexander Bodie or Body, however you pronounce it, during a so-called revival, okay, And following the, quote, laying on of hands from Alexander's wife, okay, uh, her name was Mary, uh, Mr. Wigglesworth supposedly began to experience speaking in tongues. Now, I don't even want to call it tongues because it's gibberish, because it's never a known language. It's just a bunch of gibberish, right? Acts 2 again says it has to be a known language if it's even a function. So, So now you got Wigglesworth. He was infected with the false teaching the second dose of the spirit, perfectionism from growing up in the Methodist. He was infected with the false teaching, the charismatic stuff from the Salvation Army, right? And then he supposedly has this experience because somebody laid hands on him, this lady, right, from this guy, okay? So he, he's into it through and through. By the way, this Alexander Bodie, if you're wondering who that guy is, he's basically one of the founders of the Pentecostalism in Britain. So that's that kind of contact there. Oh, by the way, again, you're going to see this all blend together. His mother, this guy back here, this Alexander Bodie, his mother was a descendant of Mary Vazale, who had been married to John Wesley. You see it all just kind of blend together, doesn't it? Right? So Bodie was also not only inspired by, again, Wesley stuff. Here comes your charismatic stuff. Uh, He was also inspired by the holiness movement. What do we see with that? Well, that's that same thing way back here that they said, you know, it's going to produce perfectionism. So, so he's getting it from both angles. And he had a, quote, intense religious experience uh, in 1892. So again, notice it's based on what? The Bible? Put it to the test. What was, what's he basing all this on? Experience, not this. Right? And then supposedly his wife, 
uh, had the so-called gift of healing by laying hands on people, right? So this, this thing is, your, we're going to see again in more detail in a second, this idea of laying hands on people and, or, you know, smack them in the forehead and all that stuff and they're supposed to get healed, right? Nothing new, folks. Again, we're, we're in the what? We're in the late 1800s still. We're not even anywhere near the supposed beginnings of this latest movement of the Spirit of God, 1906, Azusa Street Revival. Okay, so this has been going on. Bodhi also helped found other uh, Pentecostal organizations, uh, not just in Britain, but Pentecostal Mission Missionary Union. He was a member of the Pentecostal International Advisory Council, so he was in deep. Oh, also, by the way, he defended, this guy again, uh, he defended uh, infant baptism. Well, that's another false teaching, right? Why would you defend that? Do babies know what in the world they're doing, right? Uh, you ever wonder why they cry when people do that? It's very annoying, right? They don't know, right? Can they respond to the gospel? Can they, so why would you baptize them? You baptize somebody after they've made an adult decision to respond to the gospel, to what Jesus, babies can't do that. So why are you dunking them? He defended it. So another false teaching. But again, you see a pattern here, put it to the test. If you get outside this book and you base your reality on experience and then you're surrounded by all other kind of other false teachers, and then you just make it up as you go. Again, with all due respect, Mr. Booth, who made you the one in charge to decide who gets to be in charge and that your wife can be a co-pastor? God didn't give you that authority. Right? So you're seeing a pattern of people just, I'm just going to do it. God told me, right? it's the way it is. And that's where you get false teachings and false teachers. So he defended that as well. So now let's get back to Smith's Wigglesworth. Remember, this, that Bodie guy's wife, on top of already Smith Wigglesworth, let me just go ahead and get this on the list there. Wigglesworth. Look at that, I'm wiggling all over the place. So anyway, so he's already surrounded with the false teachings of the charismatic movement, right? And then now this lady comes, one of the founders of the Pentecostals in Britain, and he supposedly speaks in gibberish. Well, he probably did speak in gibberish, but he's supposed to be spoken tongues. Okay, uh, but anyway, so that's what happened. Then he began to speak at some of the assemblies of God in Great Britain. Now, we're probably going to have, Lord willing, uh, a whole study on Assemblies of God uh, eventually. And that movement and major mega splits off from that, including, believe it or not, maybe in a couple of weeks we can get to our workbook on Oneness Pentecostalism, right? Uh, we'll get into that as well. We'll also get into uh, uh, the Foursquare and some other denominations and where they come from and all that stuff. But uh, he, So he's at Assemblies of God. Uh, he also, quote, received ministerial credentials with the Assembly of God in the United States where he evangelized during the 1920s and later. Er, stop right there. So you were illiterate until your wife taught you how to read, and that's great, but you got no training. With all due respect, I got to give you some gumption, but you were a plumber and you just said, I'm going to be a preacher, right? And then you go before a, quote, church denomination, and they said, yeah, you're ordained. Really? No qualifications? He doesn't have any training? Folks, I'm telling you, this goes on a lot, right? They'll just pick somebody, hey, brother so-and-so, get on up here, right? And some, oh, man. And the scripture says you better be careful about laying hands on a young convert. And dare I say somebody that's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Because you're going to share in their sins, man. You better be careful, right? You're going to thrust them out. How, are you even sure they're saved? Right? But a lot of people say, man, look good. I mean, he's breathing right here. He, he comes to church services. Let's lay hands on him. It's crazy, folks. I'm telling you, that goes on a lot more than people realize. Okay, Now, Wigglesworth, let's get to the charismatic stuff. And again, what you're going to see is, let's put it to the test, right? Test all the spirits. Right? Now, what we're being told today with these healings and all these miracles and all this, this weird shaking and going on and all this, that this is the latest movement of God. Really? Mr. Wigglesworth was doing this. He was the ultimate con artist. He was doing this long before Benny Hinn or Finney Ben, whatever you want to call him, okay, came on the scene. Okay, Wigglesworth was doing this. Watch this. Wigglesworth believed in healing. Now, where did he get that influence from? Probably that lady that believed she had the gift of healing that laid hands on him and supposedly he spoke in tongues, right? But when he was forbidden to lay hands on audience members by the authorities in Sweden, why? Uh, we don't like what you're doing, dude. Get out of here. Right? But he was forbidden by that. Then he preached a corporate healing by which people laid hands on themselves. 
just it's a workaround. He's just making up as he goes. Now, but he also, if you want to get this guaranteed healing, now again, this is Wigglesworth. This is way early on, right? He also practiced anointing with oil. There's something supernatural about that oil that will give you your, this is, isn't this sound familiar on the charismatic community today on TV? Yeah, let me show you one guy. And he doesn't do the anointing oil that I know of, but he's got that miracle spring water. And if all, if you pour this on your head, you're going to see a lady squirted it up her nose. You can have miracles. But of course, it's going to cost you. Nothing new under the sun, folks. Wigglesworth was doing this for a long time. These guys are just rehashing. But here's Mr. Popoff, as we saw before. Let's take a look. God has used Reverend Peter Popoff throughout his entire life and ministry to bring miraculous deliverance to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Look at that man go! Woo! Man! Oh, I'll tell you, Jesus made you dance like that. Yeah! Yes! Yeah! You had four brain tumors? I had four brain surgeries, and the proof is right here in the back of my head. I stayed in the hospital for eight months. When I came home, two weeks later, my husband was killed. His family wrote the military and told the military I was dead, took all my money. I just got a warrants letter for $390,000. $390,000? Everything you say in those letters is to the team from the Holy Ghost. You say, is that going to happen to me? Yes. Even more have had huge sums of miracle money transferred into their accounts supernaturally. My bills are paid and I got money to spare. I am now a real estate investor. I have started a jewelry business on eBay. Amen. I am on my way to my multi-million dollar potential. I believe there's somebody out there, they have a child who's been diagnosed with ADD, hyperactivity, and, and learning disabilities. And I believe if you anoint your child with, these, with this miracle spring water, God's going to touch that child. Amen. He's going to buckle down. He's going to study. He's going to get straight A's. Get better grades than he ever got before. Right. And you'll know it's because of God's supernatural right. touch. It's a girl, Liz. It's, it's, a girl. it's a girl, yes. Well, you just don't want to give her dr drugs because that doesn't do any good. You use have to use the miracle, miracle spring, spring water. water. This sister was diagnosed right before Christmas with cervical cancer. But my daughter told the doctor the devil is a lie, so she anointed my head and my cervix. Most of the time, God lets me tell them exactly what they're going to win and when they're going to win it, and they're shocked and we're we're rejoicing. I actually poured some down my husband's room while he was sleeping. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he gave his life to the Lord two Sundays after that. And she got the miracle spring walk. And I put it inside the sinus uh, spray that I spray in my nose. And the strangest thing that happened, I already had three surgeries. But I'm going to tell you something, God did a miracle. I couldn't even walk even to that stage, Brother Popoff. But I'm going to tell you, God did a miracle. Not only what, did he heal my body, I was able to cut grass, something I didn't do in two years. God's will for us has always been to be in health and to prosper. And he's using the miracle spring water to do just that. Now I sent for the miracle spring water, and I want to let you know that God gave me a $50,000 debt cancellation. I was delivered from all different type, high blood pressure, fibromyalgia. Uh, you name it, God delivered me from it. Get the spring water, it really works. The doctors had given her up for dead, and her husband brought her the miracle spring water. And my husband brought the spring water up, and I drank it. And I'm speaking today, I had no speech, totally paralyzed, and now I'm testifying that through the miracle of God and your ministry. Listen, she had no speech, she's speaking today. You're next in line for a miracle. No, you're next in line to get ripped off. Now, we've already dealt with him before, but again, with this miracle water, this whole gimmick for your healing, you got to have this special little gimmick or trinket or whatever. This is nothing new, folks. Smith Wigglesworth was doing this back in his day, right? Nothing new under the sun. It's just rehashed, repackaged by the charismatic community for a generation who doesn't learn their own history. And people continue to get ripped off. Now, we've already dealt with this, but Popoff, he was exposed as a total fraud back in the 80s. Remember that? 
1986, he was exposed on the Johnny Carson show. If you guys recall, I've shared a video clip many studies ago. And here's what they found. With computerized radio scanners, the people, they would go to his meetings. They were able to demonstrate that Popoff's wife, Elizabeth, was using a wireless radio transmitter to broadcast information to an earbud that he had inside. And she would tell him information that the people had filled out on the prayer cards. And so there's somebody here, her name's Alice, and, and she's got a heart disease. Well, yeah, they got it from your card. They made you fill out. Nothing supernatural. Anyway, that all got exposed in 1986. The next year, 1987, he declared bankruptcy, listing more than 790 unpaid creditors. And yet in 1998, only 10 years later, the guy came back. I was like, did, does, apparently nobody watches the Johnny Carson show. <laughs> it, it, it made a comeback and now here's what he did now you're going to notice the theme with these charismatic communities right it's bad enough these gimmicks and false teachings and but you're ripping people off but they target a certain group of people and it's typically uh, poor people or uh, uh, bl the black african-american community watch this seeking to jumpstart his ministry because now he had a 10-year hiatus he repackaged himself for an African-American audience, which you can see by and large was what the commercials are doing. And he bought airtime on the Black Entertainment BET television network, along with another huckster, Don Stewart and Robert Tilton. So you're going after a specific community that unfortunately seems to fall for this. Now, that doesn't mean the color has nothing to do with the fall for it. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're taught the Bible, you're not going to fall for this baloney. I mean, we laugh at this, but what, what has happened to these people? They're getting ripped off by a con artist who was already called out, and now he's making a comeback. How could he make a comeback? How could people like Benny Hinn and all these other guys, how could they keep doing this? Because people aren't reading their Bible, and dare I say they're not following the Bible. The moment you come across somebody and they're exposed or they're a false teaching or they're a false prophet, they say, God told me that the, the fires are going to happen. And you know, How many different prophecies did Benny Hinn have? We've been through this before. And not, obviously, none of them came to pass. The very first one, why are you still waiting? The very first one, shut them off. If you're not going to send money to Salvation Army that's preaching a false gospel, why are you supporting these hucksters? You're going to be accountable for that. And yet they, these guys are raking in millions of dollars. But they're ripping people off with false teachings and it's all over greed. But nothing new. You study the history, the untold history of the charismatic movement. Mr. Wigglesworth, he was a pioneer in this huckster stuff. Okay, but that's not the only thing he did. He also, Mr. Wigglesworth, he also didn't do just the anointing oil that's going to give you secret power. And he also did prayer handkerchiefs. Right? That's nothing new. He was doing this all along, right? Prayer handkerchiefs. And we already dealt with this in the first part of our study, what the Bible was really going on there with that uh, unique passage in the scripture. Certainly doesn't mean that we're dealing with that today. Uh, but he distributed prayer handkerchiefs. He even sent one to, during his day, to King George IV, because we all know that ill health is due to demons. Now, I do think that there are certain, we see evidence in scripture that sometimes illness can be a spiritual attack, spiritual warfare. But certainly not all. But see, that's the thing. It's all spiritual demons. And in order to get healed, Smith Wiggleworth said, you need one of my anointed prayer handkerchiefs. Now, does that sound familiar? Yeah. Nothing new under the sun. Here's just one guy doing it today, ripping people off. The same community, by the way. Let's take a look. Talking to somebody that's having financial trouble. You need a financial miracle, and you need that financial miracle right now. It's almost like the devil trying to take something away from you. It's a fear in your heart that you're going to lose maybe the house, the car. I don't know what it is. God, supernatural miracles that happen for you. I'm getting ready to take you into the service. You're getting ready to see miracles happening right before your eyes. Sick bodies are being healed. Pain instantly leaving that body. That's all on to our website. Order the red blood of Jesus praying to you. And watch God work a miracle for you just like this. My hip is deteriorating and I say I need a hip replacement. A what replacement? A hip replacement. And you're hurting right now? Yes, I am. You sure? Yes. Before the pain right now. What you got this stick for? 
You won't need it no more. Now I want to move that hip. Shake it to the east. Shake it to the If God told me to make them red, representing the blood of Jesus that covers all. Spiritual, mental, physical, material, social, uh, as well as financial. I want to see God bless you in every area of your life. The Lord just told me to tell you that he wants to make you whole. Want to make you whole. Spiritually, mentally, physically. I feel such an anointing. And yay, I would say unto thee, my child, yes, I'm talking to you, that this is your time and this is your season to receive miracles in your life. You ready for your miracle? Yes, I'm looking for my miracle. What city are you calling from? I'm calling from Desmond, Iowa. Have you called for the anointed prayer handkerchief? Have I, have I called for my handkerchief? Uh-huh. All right, how can we pray for you this morning? Yeah, well, I, 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 I was actually having a lot of pain in my, my elbows and whatnot. Okay. Is it hurting right now? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 hurting right now. I really, I I have to sit with my elbows and my arms folded all day long. I can't move. And are they hurting right now? Yeah, yes, it's hurting right now. All right, listen, God's getting ready to heal yes, your body. You. I hear the Lord saying that the miracles that you've been standing in the gap waiting for, that the miracles is on its way right now. And God is healing your body right now. I want you to shake those arms right now and move those elbows right now. Because I'm shaking them. Because God is healing you Who, right now. Did you feel that? No, I didn't. T tell me how you feel now. I, I still feel the pain, but the pain. But the pain is leaving out right now. No, it's not. And that's sad. Here's that guy. You can hear him. He's like crying. And he's getting ripped off, being led astray. Nothing new under the sun. This ain't some latest movement of the Spirit of God. This guy's unique, whatever. Smith Wigglesworth was doing this way back in his day. Oh, by the way, that's a guy named Kearney Thomas, as you saw. He's a Pentecostal TV televangelist, whatever. He has a radio show in Houston, Texas. He claims, quote, claims to be a member of the Church of God in Christ, the largest African-American Pentecostal group in America. His theology and practices, quote, have been questioned by many. Right Now, not only does he have the prayer handkerchief that he uses as a gimmick to rip people off, okay, you, you sell them, you, you see it doesn't work, okay, but he also does this one, olive oil soap. Not just soap, but olive oil. Why? Because that's in the Bible. Not olive oil soap, but olive oil. So you put that on soap and somehow it's a miracle. Yeah, it's a miracle that this guy gets away with this. But listen, olive oil soap, not just a prayer handkerchief. He does this olive oil soap. And quote, a person can be guaranteed a way to make a miracle manifest in someone's life with this olive oil soap as well. Uh, and this olive oil soap, he says, can cure people of AIDS, cancer, and common aches and pains. Now, this guy also believes that he's a prophet, which we saw is not in function today. Similar to the Old Testament prophets, which is not true. He also, listen to this, advises people to, quote, come to him first before they speak with their pastor about an issue. Now, that sounds like a cult leader. Excuse me? Wow. And he also asserts that his viewers should send money to him and his ministry, quote, in exchange for miracles, and that, quote, the greater the amount, the greater the blessing. You're a con artist. You're ripping people off. But again... Nothing new. Smith Wigglesworth was doing this a long time ago. Just been repackaged. Now, back to Mr. Wigglesworth. And again, this guy is looked upon as this great, incredible hero of the charismatic movement. Mr. Wigglesworth. Really? Well, he also believed that the, quote, his ministerial success, you know what it was due to? Quote, speaking in tongues. That's what it was. That's why he was so incredible. Really? 
And he says, quote, I want you to see that he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself or builds himself up. Quote, we must be edified before we can edify the church. Er, we've already dealt with this whole issue, but the Bible is very clear. What are the spiritual gifts given for? For the edification of self? No, never. It's always for the benefit of what? others and he's got it so twisted that he says this is for you in fact you can't edify others until you edify yourself that's putting self first and what we see was the number one law of satanism the number one law of satanism is, is satanism is do what you will shall be the whole of the law it's all about self first man this ain't come from god he also claimed to have many prophecies he had, a, believe it or not, an international ministry. He, quote, ministered, if you want to call it that, in U.S., Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Sweden, the Pacific Islands, India, several countries throughout Europe. Uh, his sermons were even transcribed in Pentecostal magazines early in the day. Uh, there were also numerous claims of divine healing, which there's been no, obviously, proof for. He supposedly healed this woman of a tumor. He healed another woman from tuberculosis. Uh, a wheelchair-confined woman began walking. There were also reports that he supposedly supposedly raised people from the dead, including his wife, Polly. Really? I'm sure she wasn't in on that one. Now, here's another thing. Nothing new under the sun, folks. All the stuff that you're seeing, this, oh, the reason why it's so strange is because it's the last days and it's a special outpouring of God's spirit. Here's another thing that Smith Wigglesworth was a pioneer in, in the charismatic community way back then. His, again, his only training was as a plumber. But he described cancer as an evil living spirit and insisted that many diseases were of satanic in origin. And here's his method. So, so he had this uh, uh, aspect with the anointing oil. He had the prayer handkerchiefs. But he had another gimmick that you, he did to you in order to get your healing. And I quote, his methods often involved hitting, slapping, or punching the afflicted part of the body. He literally would take it out on you. And somehow, that's supposed to be the Spirit of God giving you a healing. Now, folks, if you're familiar with the charismatic community, that same baloney is going on today. One gentleman who's doing the exact same thing that Wigglesworth did, nothing new under the sun. It's just been repackaged for today's generation who does not know their own history is a guy named Todd Bentley. That's his big thing. This is the guy who punches and kicks and hits people supposedly to have a healing. Watch this. Sir, what's happening? When I was two years old, I got dreadful disease, polio. That po leg disabled. Paralyzed on I one was. side? Yes, only right, right leg. Two years old, you had polio? Yes. That's but rare. You're told the damaged uh, nerve can be healed. I trust God can heal me. Do you feel anything right now? I can feel the heat on yeah. my right leg. Lift your hands up for me. Lift your hands God, I command polio. 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 I just command healing in that leg. Can you feel that? Polio. 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 I said, God, I've prayed for like a hundred crippled people, not one. He said, that's because I want you to grab that lady's crippled legs and bang them up and down on the platform like a baseball bat. <laughs> I walked up and I grabbed her legs and I started going, be healed, be healed. I started banging them up and down on the platform. She got healed. And I'm thinking, God, why is not the power of God moving? He said, because you haven't kicked that woman in the face. And there's this older lady worshiping right in front of the platform. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face <laughs> with your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. Bam! And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the power of God. And I saw and the gift of faith came on me. I said, what do I do, God? And God told me to just run them down. So I jumped up in the air and I went, bam! And I hit him to the ground, jumped onto him, 
and got into a full mount. Ground and pound. I jumped on there and I was in a full mount and something came over me and instead of punching I grabbed him by the neck and started choking him. And I said, come out of him devil! Come out of him devil! Now I was in another meeting one time and I called out this Chinese gentleman. And all of a sudden I went running down the aisle and I, I hit this guy so hard it drove him back several feet. He hit the ground and his tooth popped right out of his mouth. You see how many times God told me? God didn't tell you none of that stuff. That ain't the Spirit of God. If that even really even happened. Okay. Nothing new in the sun, folks. He's just ripping this off from uh, Mr. Wigglesworth who was doing this. This is no latest movement of the Spirit of God. That's why it's so strange and weird. Nothing. Todd Bentley, by the way, we might have a whole study on him later. I don't know. But uh, he's from Canada, if you're not familiar with him. And in 1998, he uh, took over the leadership of a ministry called Fresh Fire Ministry. There's that word again. Fire. Fresh Fire. Not just fire, John. This is Fresh Fire. Right, He took over the leadership, uh, but then, uh, that was 1998, uh, in 2008, he resigned because he cheated on his wife with a staff member, and uh, in fact, even the people on the staff said that he's, quote, entered into an unhealthy relationship. So he, uh, on the next year, he divorced his wife after committing uh, adultery, apparently, and married this other lady, uh, and then, that's 2009, so what happened to him? Dude, get out of here. You're out of the pulpit. Sorry. Nope. Next year, he's back preaching, teaching, doing this stuff. No accountability? No discipline? It's almost like somebody's not reading their Bible. Or they certainly aren't following it, right? Uh, again, he says that his top priority is to, quote, help people to experience the presence of God. How about become a disciple of God? That's what Jesus said, Matthew 28, the very end. What did he say? Go into all the world and help people experience God. No, become a disciple, a disciplined learner of God's word. And he says, listen, and the reason why, that's his top priority, to cope, help people experience the presence of God. And I quote, because if we don't have signs, then all we have is a bunch of theology. Well, yeah, that's what you need. Theos, God, ology, study of, the study of God, study of God's word, so you can't be led astray by hucksters like you. But notice how he downplays that. You and I who would study theology and study the Bible, we have a, a fundamental spirit, a religious spirit, religiosity. We're just reading. He also includes testimonies, uh, claims that he encountered a meeting with the Apostle Paul. Did you know that? Yeah. Also, he preached about an encounter with an angel that he called Emma at an assembly of God's church. Uh, the angel appeared in female form. Er, does the Bible anywhere have female angels? No. You won't find it. So you know that's not from God. And But this female angel, which is not from the word of God, quote, sprinkled gold dust at this meeting. We saw that before. Remember the lady who admitted they were putting the Hobby Lottie gold, gold litter through the vents? <laughs> yeah, got it on tape, right? Uh, but this was supposed to illustrate financial blessings to come upon the congregation at that time, okay? It's just, it's just a bunch of blood. But nothing new. One more thing with Wigglesworth. So he's the guy... With the charismatic stuff, he's the guy with supposedly this healing thing, crusades and all that stuff, with the gimmickry, with the anointed oil and the prayer handkerchief and all, nothing, and the punching, hitting, slapping, kicking people. But he's also the guy, okay, nothing new under the sun, who if you didn't get your healing, whose fault was it? Yours. Because either you didn't apparently give enough money or didn't have enough faith or you got some secret sin. Does that sound familiar? Nothing new under the sun, folks. Mr. Wigglesworth was doing it a long time ago. And I quote, On a number of occasions, his approach to per persons suffering from stomach complaints, again, was to punch them in the stomach with such a force that it propelled them across the room. When challenged on this, he said, I didn't hit them, I hit the devil. Well, it's just like Mr. Bentley. Oh, come on, let me hit the devil. <laughs> Wigglesworth declared to the sick, I only pray for you once, to pray twice is unbelief. You hear that today, right? Don't, you just ask one time. Just one time you need to pray. Just one time. Don't, don't do it again. That means you don't believe God. You don't just want, excuse me? What about the persistent widow? I prayed over and over again. Oh, by the way, read uh, Matthew, was it seven? When it says to, to ask, to seek, and to knock. When you're asking for something, right? Uh, some, some of these guys with this false teaching say you only got to pray once. Just got to have enough faith. 
That's not even what the scripture says. If you go into the Greek, every one of those verbs is in the continuance. So you know what that is? It literally says this, ask and keep on asking. Seek, keep on seeking. Reverently knock, the Greek says, and the door will be opened up unto you. That's what it literally says. So you're wrong on a multitude of levels, but that's what he says, you know that. And then a man approached the altar, received prayer again. Wigglesworth recognized him and said, quote, didn't I pray for you last night? You were full of unbelief. Get off of this platform. Well, maybe it's because your huckster's ways didn't work. It's crazy, nothing new. One guy says this, the attitude of these guys is basically, if you can't heal them, beat them. <laughs> Yet, let me close with this. Wigglesworth is considered uh, by Pentecostal and charismatic uh, circles as royalty. This guy's looked upon as like, this is the big guy. If only we could have somebody like Wigglesworth today, right? But they're ignorant of his aberrant and unbiblical ministry tactics, okay? Uh, he focused the core of his ministry on signs and wonders, healings and miracles and tongues, i.e. gibberish. He taught that believers should refuse medical treatment for any illness. Now you're starting to sound like Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, and again, here it comes. If people didn't get healed, he was sure to place the blame on the sick. Wigglesworth taught that everyone should be able to control their own healing. What do you, who do you think you are, God? He also blamed those who couldn't get rid of them, their sickness on their own sin or lack of faith. Okay? And to one sick woman, he barked, ah, If you'll get rid of your self-righteousness, God will do something for you. Sin is the cause of your sickness. Talk about putting salt on a wound. Acid in the... Here's somebody... Mm. with no regard for biblical teaching and praying or trusting in God's will God's purposes uh, that he has through physical trials or sanctification or evidences in the scripture where people were purposely by God he didn't heal them but he had good reasons for it now we've already gone through this but let me just give you a couple quick examples Galatians 4 13 through 14 Paul speaking obviously he said as you know it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you, even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. So God used that illness that Paul had to get the gospel to the Galatians. And when he approached the Galatians with a known illness that apparently lasted for a while, was it because Paul didn't have enough faith? Or did they say, hey, get away from me, Paul. Get off this stage, Paul. You don't have you, unbelief in you. Look at you. Otherwise, you'd be healed. That's ridiculous. James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? Including health trials. Hello. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God uses trials, even health concerns, to what? To make you mature in Christ. Right? Man, praise God he's given me good health. Once in a blue moon, it's probably because somebody, I wasn't looking, they sprayed my ear with chicken juice or something. I might get ill. But in the very rare times that that happens, and I'm not saying to boast, I'm just saying I, I'm very thankful for that, believe you me. Um, but on the rare occasions it does, I tell you what, every time, I, I, I'm, God, thank you. Thank you for your sustaining power, how fragile we are as people. Uh, please keep this body healthy to run long and hard for you. It ain't about me. It's about trying to get as much mileage. But, but you, can, you can grow through trials, including health trials. It's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that you don't have enough faith. One more real quick. 2 Timothy 4, 19 through 20. Listen to this. Paul says this. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth. I left, Paul speaking, I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Well, how come, Paul? You didn't have any anointing oil on you? Oh, did you lose your prayer handkerchief? Did somebody steal it? You ain't got enough faith? You need to sow me a, a seed to one of these guys' ministry. And then they're going to come back with this cornmeal miracle packet. And you can put it on him and he'll get healed. And he'll... It's a lie. And it's ripping people off. And we'll close with this. People merely searching for hope were devastated when men like Wigglesworth humiliated them with his shameful practices. It's your sin. You, you... Still countless modern-day Pentecostal and charismatic preachers ignore the hard facts of the history and consider Wigglesworth a hero of their faith. Regardless of modern sentiment, Wigglesworth was a charlatan who exploited the sick by teaching falsely about salvation, sin, and sickness. His legacy does not represent Christianity nor the true character of biblical leadership. Those who wish to represent uh, Christ must arm themselves with the truth. What's our opening text? You need to put this stuff to the test. 
All right, so somebody got, hey, did you hear about Smith Wigglesworth? That guy was a man of God. There were so many miracles. He had the anointing of God, the Spirit of God. He had so much fresh fire all over him. It was oozing everywhere. Really? Let's put it to the test. Like we did tonight. You would, if you knew what was going on, and you knew the Bible, man, there's no way you would promote that guy. And not just that guy, but what the false teachings are, which are still continuing on today. Right? And it close with this. The dark history of abusive false teachers is not where Christians should ever find their truth or claim their heritage, including the modern day Wigglesworth people today. And yet, you know what gets me? These guys, like the Salvation Army, like the Benny Hens, like these televangelists, they're all over the media. And the lost looks at them. And the lost is way more ready to call these guys hucksters, uh, false teachers, than even we are in the church. But when it comes time for you and I to share the gospel, and this is what they think of Christianity because this is what's in the media, you wonder why they look at you and I and go, you're one of them. Bad witness. False teaching. It's not good. That's why we're dealing with this. Now, Lord willing, next time we're going to deal with, listen to this, Quimby, Evans, Sanford, Dowie, Kenyon, Parm, Seymour, which all led up to the Azusa Street Revival. Now we're finally at the spot where they say it all started, but what we've been seeing, we put it to the test. <laughs> it's been going on this whole time, ever since the death of the last apostle. And remember, the biggest danger is what? Get away from this book. God told me to tell you. I got a word from God. I got something better than this. I had this experience. I had this vision. I had this dream. I had this. And all of it, this is the danger. All of this leads people away from the Bible. And that's where you're going to get duped every single time. And that's why we're dealing with this second part. Well, hi, this is Billy Crone of Get Life Ministries. And I hope you were blessed with this study. But in closing, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? Before you answer that, let me share a couple of things that the Bible says. Did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not? And the wages of our sin or unholiness is death. In other words, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and be separated from God for all eternity. This is the great cosmic dilemma. God who is holy and we are not, how can we have a relationship with Him? The two will never mix. Now, to make matters worse, we don't even want to admit this, even though God already knows He's God. And so God, out of love, gave us something called the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were not something to just memorize or stick on your wall or give the appearance of being a religious person. The Ten Commandments were God's divine x-ray, if you will, into our heart and soul to reveal this truth that we need to admit. And that is this, that God is holy and that we are not. We are disqualified for heaven. So let's take a look at that divine x-ray that God's trying to get us to realize. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments, the, the ninth one says, you shall not bear false witness. That's lying, okay? How many guys have ever told a lie? Raise your hand, okay? Well, if you didn't raise your hand, you just did. You just told a lie because we've all done that. Well, that makes us a liar. The, another Ten Commandments says that you shall not steal. Don't ever take anything without permission. How many of you guys uh, have ever done that? Well, you guys already said you're a bunch of liars. All of our hands should have went up on that one. And for being honest, God already knows. Folks, we've all taken something. We've stolen something, right? That makes us a thief. Another Ten Commandments says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. He's not just holy. Even His name is holy. Hey, folks, let's be honest. If you can believe it, even the name of Jesus Christ uh, has been turned into a common cuss word. Well, the Bible says that's a sin of blasphemy. Now we're a, a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus said, here's His standard. Uh, uh, even if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you committed adultery in your heart. Wow, so now we're an adulterer. The Bible says you shall not murder. And you might think, well, hey, at least I haven't done that one. Really? Again, the Bible says that the sin of hatred, wishing somebody was dead, okay, that, that's the same thing. Uh, it's akin to the sin of murder. It's just you pulled the trigger in your heart, but God sees the heart. Hey, folks, that's just five out of ten. How are you doing? You still think you're going to get to heaven on your own? You still think that you're qualified, that you're holy like God, and you could bridge the gap and have a relationship with Him forever? I don't think so. I mean, what did we just see? You're going to stand before God, and so am I. We all are. And we're going to have to give an account 
for who we are. Hey, hey God, let me in. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a liar. I, I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer. I'm an adulterer. I'm a murderer. And the scripture is very clear, folks. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're in trouble. But folks, here's the good news. The Bible says that if we would just admit that, that's the first step. To admit that God is holy, that I'm not, I'm disqualified for heaven, I need a Savior. If we would admit that and then ask for the Savior to save us. That, that's what God was doing with Jesus. God gave us His Son, Jesus Christ. He took the death penalty in our place so that we could be completely forgiven of everything we've ever done and be made holy through Jesus so that we can now have a relationship with God both here and now and forever in heaven. We can become qualified. The word that the Bible uses is a word called pardon, that God is willing to pardon us of all of our sins and crimes that we've committed against Him and disqualified us, that disqualified us for heaven, right? And we've actually seen this work in real life. Uh, for instance, uh, there's been people who have committed crimes, gone to court, the gavel's been passed, the judge has said, hey, listen, we all know you're guilty, uh, you even admit you're guilty, and uh, for your crimes, you're going to not just jail, you're going to uh, await in jail to go to the death penalty. And did you know that there actually is a way that somebody could get off of death row? It's called a pardon. The one in the authority, the governor, can grant what's called a pardon for that person's crimes, and they literally can go free. Not because of something they did, because the deeds are already done, you can't undo it. Not because of they tried to clean up their act while they were stuck in the jail cell, because that doesn't change anything. But simply out of mercy, the person who has the authority can give them a pardon, and they can go free. And did you know it's actually on historical record that there have been people who have been granted a pardon from the death penalty and they've refused to take it. And so even though the offer was there to be set free, they themselves still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, in a nutshell, that's what God's doing every single day with all of us this side of heaven. While you still have breath, you still have an opportunity to receive God's pardon. He's willing to forgive you of all your sins if you would just receive His pardon through Jesus Christ. Again, that's what He was doing on the cross. The cross was the death penalty of the day. But since we weren't there, and since we can't earn it, it's a gift from God, you have to receive that by faith. Reach out even today from your own spiritual jail cell, if you will, and say yes to Jesus and God's pardon so that you could be set free and go to heaven. The Bible says that if you will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the grave, you will be saved. Hey folks, if that's you, don't delay. You may not even have tomorrow. Today could be your last day. Please accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess with your mouth He is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the grave and the Bible says you will be saved. Well, this has been Billy Crone of Gill Life Ministries. If there's anything that we could do for you, our information and, and number will come up here shortly. And please don't hesitate to contact us. But remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless.